Hold up. Welcome to Mama Juice, and thank you for joining thank me you. today. I want to know what it was like to get your COVID vaccine. I think it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. <laughs> I was very happy to get it. Uh, you know, all these months of us just having this fear of COVID, especially as a doctor and, and healthcare workers being exposed every day, just the thought of something going in my arm that was going to help protect me in the long run was just so gratifying and we all choke everyone's choking up when they get it because we just so we were so worried for so long so it was great it was really great yes i've seen that a lot and my friends that were really on the front lines um i have a friend who's a hospital social worker and she filmed mm -hmm. it and she was like yeah. so she had so much gratitude even for the person administering it and i'm just i'm excited but i'm like i'm on the bottom of the totem pole so <laughs> i don't know when i'll get one but uh, what would you say to somebody who has reservations about getting it? Uh, I, I think there is a, a, a percentage of population of people who are reticent with vaccines. Um, and some people are reticent because it came out so quickly. Yeah. Um, but they really started making the vaccine almost immediately from the point that, it, that China said COVID was there. So that come up, came up about December, right? So what happened was a doctor in China who first saw the COVID um, virus actually mapped the genome of the virus and sent it out to all the scientists around the world. So they took that genome and immediately started working on a vaccine. And so the vaccine development actually started last December. So it's been a full year. Okay. So that's, a, that's, I think, a little helpful to understand that it wasn't just four or five months of it. it was, it's been a year of development. And they've used a new technology, which the laboratories and the scientists were wanting to use this new mRNA technology on vaccines. I haven't quite gotten the opportunity to start researching it because you need seeded money and things like that to research and, and figure it out. So they use this opportunity to try this new way of making a vaccine and it was successful. So they've done their testing, they've gone through their phase tri trials, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three trials, phase three trials is on humans. And a lot of people who had bad effects from it. Mm -hmm. um, there were a few, but there's always a few with any population of people. When you have a huge population of people, there'll be mm -hmm. a small minority that will have some kind of side effect to it. Oh. And they found that it was safe. So, um, I would say people shouldn't be reserved about getting it. I think it's uh, been well researched and, and well checked. And um, to go ahead and feel feel confident that the scientists have backed up their research and they know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing, you know. So who who are we to sit back and say, like, do you really know what you're talking about? It's like, it's not a bad thing. But I will be honest when they first announced that they they had these vaccines mm -hmm. i had some hesitation myself and i'm very very pro vaccine but i i did have that feeling of this is so new it's so quick you know i i guess i was gonna say i've never been somebody to take a new vaccine but that's a lie because when i was working in pediatrics we had a rep there for the hpv the Gardas gardasil is that what it's mm -hmm. called yep and i was about to age out at that time for the time frame that they suggested and she convinced me and my colleague to get it and it was new and i didn't grow an extra head you know so <laughs> <laughs> it's okay but i did recently hear that too about the mrna where they've actually had that technology like you said so i think if people get the right information and they realize like you said that this isn't exactly new. As, it's not as new to the scientists as we think it is, which is very comforting to me. Very, very comforting. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure if my mom should get it though, because she has reacted to vaccines before, and I mm -hmm. did recently hear that there were several cases of anaphylaxis. And, but they were able to, you know, give them the epinephrine and they were okay, but I'm still... Afraid. So the people that 
did have some of the allergic responses of the anaphylaxis, like you said, they were people who already had, like your mom, already had a history of allergy to something, whether it was food, whether it was medicine. And they, uh, they were already with an EpiPen, they already had those things available to them. And of the people who had anaphylaxis, none of them died, none of them were that sick, they got over it quickly. And they did fine afterwards. It was just a little extra observation, a little extra checking on them. And they did fine ultimately. And there have been some things going around the internet that somebody died from, and, and that's not true. It's absolutely not true. So unfortunately, sometimes the media likes to make things sound like breaking news all the time. And, and sometimes we uh, interpret things a little hard, more severely or harshly than they should be interpreted. But we expect that some people have allergic responses to vaccines. It's usually a very tiny percentage of people. So um, the best thing to do is for your mom to talk to her doctor and like decide what they're gonna do. Should she have an EpiPen available? Should she get it at a hospital center? So if she needs yeah. to be observed for a few hours, then she can be right there. Those are the questions you should wanna ask her doctor. So interesting. I did not realize that having food allergy could potentially mean you could have a reaction to the vaccine? Is that is that what you said? Well, it, it depends on the vaccine, of course. Mm -hmm. But some vaccines have preservatives that are food related that are in other foods, you know. Um, uh, let's take, for example, I'm not saying any vaccines have this, but like uh, uh, some people have reactions to food coloring. So okay. red number five, yellow number seven, I think it is. <laughs> um, and let's say you have, let's say there's a vaccine that was colored red. It's not, there's none, but let's say. So you have the potential of reacting to that vaccine because you already react to red number five, something like that. So with the COVID vaccines, there's not too many preservatives in the COVID vaccines. They weren't, they're not meant to be stored for a very long time, like our regular vaccines we store in the office to give the kids over, you know, years. Um, so it doesn't have a lot of ingredients in it and it, and it doesn't have a lot of preservatives. So the one thing that they have, there's one thing in there, which is called polyethylene glycol, and that is the same stuff in Miralax for constipation. So it's the oh, same okay. kind of thing. Uh, so they're thinking that maybe people are reacting to that. It's called PEG, P-E-G, polyethylene glycol. So when you go for your vaccine and you're checking out the whole list, they ask about if you're allergic to PEG or not. Uh, and okay. so but if you look, if you look up, the ingredients to the vaccine, which is available on the CDC, which is available in many places now because I want everybody to know, um, you'll see that there's not a lot and that's possibly the one that you may react to. So again, talking to your doctor, if you do have lots of food allergies, do you have food allergies to certain preservatives? You know, that kind of thing. Okay. And so it has not been tested on children, correct? So it's not recommended. Correct. So uh, right now, Pfizer just, the, the week that Pfizer let their vaccine, that got, got the emergency certification and they let it out to the, the public, that week they also started enrolling children from 12 to 17 in a trial. So the holdup is we have to enroll the people of that age group and of multiple ethnicities and regions to be able to prove that it's safe before we give it to that age group, right? So as you probably understand, that it's hard to get children into yeah. studies because parents have to be brave enough to do it because of the worries. But uh, if, as soon as they get that going, so they're doing 12 to 17, that should, you know, that'll take a couple of years. So, you know, one year to two years, depending on Dr. Fauci had originally said a couple of years, but the technology was so, and the, and the race to get this vaccine out was so that they were able to do a trial in a, you know, less than a year. That's great. They were able to get enough people. They had 44,000 people in their trials. So it was enough people to really understand how the vaccine worked in people. So if they can do that, then it'll, the kids. Then we'll have to move down slowly. I think Moderna may be um, enrolling t smaller kids, but that'll take time too. So I say the best thing to do is all of us adults get vaccinated mm -hmm. so we can be a little cocoon around our children. And yeah. So they can be protected right yeah that's that's actually a recommendation that i recently heard uh because kids are known to not be as affected by the virus in general it's more important for us to have it because we're Absolutely. the ones that are, are you know as we get older the greater chance mm -hmm. to be affected by it so there's two different distributors but are the ingredients exactly the same 
Um, they're pretty much the same um, uh, because they're uh, this is basically the same vaccine being made by two uh, different uh, distributors because they're using the same information. They're not do using two novel things, two novel technologies. They're using the same technology to do it. They're just two different people, people doing it. So it's pretty much the same. The efficacy of one and the other, they're very close, but Pfizer was 95%, Moderna is 94.1% um, effective after the second dose of both of them. So, um, so those things are slightly different, but overall they're very close. Okay. And so then do we know, is this going to be similar to the flu shot? Are we going to get it every year? So we don't know that, that yet because we don't know the we don't know how COVID works in our bodies. If it's something that we'll lose immunity to um, with the vaccine over time, because it's it's something that we lose immunity to, like the flu shot, we, you know, we get it every year. Or the other side of it is the COVID itself mutating every year, like the flu does. The flu adds different mutations every year. That's why we have a new flu shot every year. And if we'd have to get a COVID shot every year. So we don't know that yet. That Those studies have to be ongoing right now because people are getting the shot now and they can study people and, and figure out that. More. But it, it'll either be a one-time shot or it'll be like the flu shot every year and you choose to get it every year. Okay. Yeah. I will definitely choose to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm on board. I'm, I, you know, I think, I think it's very scary as a parent and as a human because there's so much information out there and you get to the point where you're like, I don't even know who to trust anymore. I do feel like I have kind of an upper hand because I, I have been in healthcare for so long that I have personal relationships with doctors and people who understand this stuff at a level that I don't. And it's, it's a lot easier for me to listen to someone like you who I know personally and trust to mm -hmm. say, okay, she knows what she's talking about, and I know it's accurate because I trust her as a human. But for people who don't have relationships with people like that, I feel like I, it's just so hard. I mean, I see all the misinformation out there. And it's definitely difficult to sometimes weed through that information because misinformation now in our area, era now is becoming so, what's the word, just so accurate in their misinformation like they, yeah. they make it look like it's so true right? right and some people choose to listen to one side versus looking at the whole picture and things like that so it ends up being difficult sometimes to weed through all that and unfortunately I feel like there's been kind of a general um, mistrust of science in the last few years so scientists are looking being looked at as not trustworthy when they should be the ones that people look to because they're usually very trustworthy right. in, in, the, in the most part. I mean, there's always been those outliers that of may course. have caused issues, uh, aka Dr. Wakefield with the right. MMR vaccine. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but no matter in, what, you're going to find like kooky people in any population. Yes. <laughs> so sometimes it's difficult. So you try your best to go to websites that you know are trusted websites trusted sources, you know, for us physicians and scientists, one of our big trusted sources is Dr. Fauci. So he has been uh, working with multiple presidential people for many, many years. He's been in his role for many, many years, and he's a trusted scientist among scientists. So we look to him because we know that he's, he's looking at the data and understanding how the data changes, how, you know, those kind of things. So unfortunately, he's been a bit of a political figure, I guess, in the last in the last few months when he's just trying to get out the truth. And that's what we're all trying to do. So we try our best, but sometimes the barrier of that really high level misinformation is hard to get through. So talking to your doctor, talking to people who are scientists, talking to people who understand this information is, I, I think, the best way to go and finding trusted websites, too. Yes. And I think, I mean, I understand wanting the transparency of putting all the data out but honestly like I feel like it's been a disservice because people don't understand it and they don't understand why that data changes and then yes. in turn the recommendation changes and I feel like I stand it I understand it at a very basic level but I feel like a lot of people haven't had the I don't know they just haven't been enlightened 
to know why that happens. So they're given this data and then they're given different data and then they're confused. And now not only the scientists, but I feel like the healthcare community has been villainized during all of this. And it's just so confusing to my brain. <laughs> have, you, <laughs> have you noticed any of that or experienced any Absolutely. of that? Absolutely. So, you know, we talk about when COVID first came out, uh, all the, uh, you know, applause for first responders and healthcare workers at seven o'clock at night, you know, they're doing that in the beginning and all the memes and news people saying, oh, thank you for healthcare workers for putting yourselves at harm's risks way and all that kind of stuff. But then we maybe ask people to do something like stay in their home to protect themselves and suddenly we're being villainized for making people stay at home. Or we're telling people to go vaccinated and suddenly we're the people trying to put microchips in people, you know, <laughs> things like that. Uh, so yes, we've seen both sides. We're, we're, you know, we're just here. We do things every day like we've always done. Right. As physicians, we're here to protect you as much as possible, to treat your ailments to advise you on your health. And we've always done that. And we always try to use evidence-based medicine. So we yeah. use the evidence that backs up our claim to be able to understand why we do this certain thing. And with COVID, unfortunately, it's changing because it's a new thing, it's something right. new that we're learning about and things change. So if numbers change, statistics change, it doesn't mean they're lying to you. It means that they're learning something new every yeah. day. So right right which i <laughs> i feel like makes sense to me mm -hmm. um but like for example i saw this instagram this woman is making a killing on basically making scientists and the government and healthcare look like a sham and i mean the amount of followers she has is it's just horrifying mm -hmm. but she posted something about like oh they tell you to wear masks they tell you to stay home and and you just so easily let them control you. And my thing is, the government did not determine what to do to prevent the spread of a virus. It's not like they just came up with this. Like, this is normal for the circumstances. You know, I, there's this picture that I saw online, and it's from the 1918 Spanish flu, mm. and everybody's wearing face coverings. Somebody's even wearing a sign around their neck that says, wear a mask or go to jail. And so it's like, we kind of have it easier now because we were just saying, please do it. So but they had at that time also had protesters, anti-mask protesters oh, really? at that time as well. Absolutely. There's always people who want to go against the grain or against what what we think is popular opinion. And uh, again, again, I think it falls down to not understanding the data, not understanding the risks mm -hmm. or a lot of people don't, if you don't see it, it doesn't exist, so it shouldn't matter yeah. to me kind of issue. Right. So we unfortunately have that when we have vaccine deniers who come into our office and tell us that children don't, are not going to get vaccinated because they've never seen those diseases, so why should they get vaccinated? And they're missing the point a little bit, aren't they? Where the reason you're not seeing those diseases is most of the people in the world are vaccinated against right. them. Right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I seriously, when I when I spoke with Dr. Horner on here, mm -hmm. you know, she talked about having compassion and empathy to anti-vaxxers. I'm like, that's why you guys are in the role you're in, and I'm not, because it just boils my blood to be honest. Because like, I'm like, how do they not put that together? Like, yes, of course you don't see them because we live in an age where we're lucky enough that everybody got vaccinated, and those things were eradicated, or at least close to in this country. Mm -hmm. Like, I hate. I hate using the word privilege because people take it a certain way, but I feel like people in the United States are just so lucky that we don't yes. even realize how lucky we are. So people have the freedom to come up with these crazy ideas because they just hear about stuff. They don't, they've never seen it like some other countries. And oh, I feel I, I, I have the privilege of having been an immigrant to this country and um, came with my mom when I was seven years old from England to here and grew up in America. Yeah, so, and my parents are from Bangladesh, which is a third world country that has 150 million people in it, in, the, in a country the size of Wisconsin. And the capital city of Bangladesh is Dhaka, Bangladesh, and that place has 90 million people in a city. Oh. 
So, <laughs> yeah. So, so sometimes I feel like people who don't understand the privilege that we have in America of being generally um, safe and uh, healthy people should go to a third world country for a week and really see what happens when the standards that we've built, the governments in America, the scientists in America have built over time to keep us relatively safe. Um, they'd appreciate it much more if they went to a third world country to see that right. or just to a second world country like Mexico right underneath us. Right. They do pretty well, but they also have their challenges. And so uh, sometimes I feel like those people who don't want to listen to what we have to say about why we have no, none of those illnesses anymore really should go to a country where those illnesses still run rampant or mm -hmm. see yes. the effects. I was having a, a not so nice conversation with an anti-vaxxer the other day on Instagram. And she was talking about how like unlikely it is for somebody to get tetanus. And I'm like, have you ever Googled tetanus and seen what it does to the human body? It's like a horror movie. Looking at those pictures is so scary. So yeah. even if there's a small chance that my child or myself could get it, being vaccinated to me is, is worth it. And she was like, well, what if, what if somebody you love or your child got injured by a vaccine? And this might be a silly analogy, but I was like, what if your child had an allergic reaction to a bee are you going to say death to all bees like people <laughs> have allergic reactions to things you know we don't just say well that's bad let's never look at that again right i know it's unfortunate um definitely tetanus is a horrible disease when every everything t like tightens up and you can't breathe and you can't open your mouth because your muscles are so tight and you die because you starve to death you know those kind of things you know that definitely is worth getting the vaccine actually to me than having to suffer through seeing my child with tetanus for sure or myself with tetanus absolutely i totally agree with you but again it's the problem of not seeing it so i don't believe it attitude and maybe listening to people who don't really know what they're doing or saying and making up a lot of stories and being able to amplify them because we have such a good social media network now so it's it's difficult for us. We try to be compassionate. We try to give leeway to people who are anti-vaxxers. And I don't take anti-vaxxers in my office. So um, I used to, and then I, I changed my mind. And um, uh, it's difficult sometimes to turn away people who want to come to you, but they don't want to vaccinate because I have to kind of stand my ground. Now, and is that a decision that you're allowed to make as a physician? Or is that a corporate decision? Does your entire... Um, uh, it's a physician decision. Okay. Um, however, our division has slowly moved and decided, um, I, I think for the most part, most of the physicians in our division are only take vaccinated um, people, but it, they definitely left it up to us, but um, they're trying to kind of, uh, you know, kind of level ground with all the other practices together of what mm -hmm. we're all going to be doing. So. Okay. And it's and for, it is being it is more and more difficult these days if you are an anti-vaxxer to find a physician who will take you because our positions are changing in order to try to increase the health of our children that we see. Um, most of us are becoming, uh, you know, back, we only take vaccinated vaccinating families. So. I mean, I support that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for it. I like I gave my daycare a hard time because I'm like, you know, we've been here for a while and you guys have never asked me for updated vaccine records and they're like oh well we only do it once a year and then it finally it came around because i guess i started around the time that they do that so then once i was there for a year they started asking they asked me for it and so i was like okay i feel better but for for a few months i was like wait a second why have they never asked me to show proof that i'm actively vaccinating my kids but they finally did and, and i felt better so back to COVID, have you mm -hmm. seen a lot of COVID positive children in your clinic? So we're seeing more now. When the first wave came across uh, in March, April, then we weren't seeing too many. And of course, we were in a kind of a lockdown then situation. Yeah. So, um, uh, but now, yes, now with this big second wave that came through in the holidays, we absolutely are seeing more. Um, I'd say we see at least one or two positives a day from the three, three of us doctors working there. Um, so yes, we are seeing more 
children are generally not as sick uh, as adults can get. They usually just look like they have a bad cold and, and plus or minus fevers, things like that. So that's a saving grace for children. They're not as sick as adults can get. Although we do have children who have some comorbidities or co-illnesses that put them at risk for having just as bad as a COVID as an elderly person would be have you know so we look at those kids closer and when they are positive i worry more um so if they're diabetic or they're obese um those are some of the worries that we have so i always look at those kids closer and watch those kids closer to make sure they're not getting super sick you know which is funny because a lot of people think when they say like oh if you're if you're healthy then you have nothing to worry about but i don't think people realize that when they say healthy a lot of us aren't because a lot of us, including myself, are obese. There are so many obese children. So it's like in America <laughs> with how bad obesity is, a lot of us are high risk yeah. automatically just because of that. I don't think people really zeroed in on that. They just think if you're old and decrepit, then yeah, you're, you're in a bad spot. But does so I've heard conflicting things about people with asthma and how COVID is affecting them. So COVID itself affects the lungs in a way of um, causing damage to the lungs um, through changes in the lung tissue. So if you already have asthma and already have changes to your lungs, uh, you're like, you could be more likely at risk of having worse lung issues with the COVID on board on top of that. So that's why we worry because if asthma is already a disease that causes, um, you know, stress on the lungs. If you add more stress to the lungs, you're going to have more trouble. Now, versus a, someone who is very well controlled with their asthma and does all their medicines and things like that, versus someone who maybe not, there may be differences there. But being vigilant with anybody with not just asthma, any other lung issue, whether it's chronic lung from birth or elderly person with COPD after smoking for many years. Anything where the lungs are already teetering a little bit on the edge of, of, of problems, adding COVID is not helpful. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So now that the vaccine has started, and do you know, do they know like how long it'll be until like the mass majority of us are vaccinated? How long can it, until we can like return to normal? <laughs> right. So if you look on the Maricopa County website, they have a timeline there. They have uh, different phases you've seen that. So phase 1A, phase 1B, phase and 2, 3, like that. And each phase is who's getting vaccinated. Right? So phase 1A is us healthcare workers, things like that. So, and then phase 1B has some people, immunocompromised and teachers and law enforcement, things like that. The next one is people over 65, you know, those kind of things. And it's moving out like that general population looks like it'll start about in the spring of next year, they'll be able to start vaccinating the general population. So if you look at that, it goes through about 2021, the whole year at least. Um, and so if we can get most of those people vaccinated, that's great. Um, we need at least over three fourths of the people to be vaccinated for any disease in general. So whether it's 75%, whether it's 85%, whether it's 90%, we need enough people vaccinated in a population to be able to have herd immunity, right? So have enough people who can be that little cocoon around that one person who can't, who has cancer, who can't get the vaccine or is severely immunocompromised or things like that. So we have to have enough people. So the hope is through 2022, we'll get that and hopefully in the next two years. So I think 2021 will still be a little bit of the same for at least half the year. Then maybe things will start opening up as more people get vaccinated. Uh, and our hopes for 2022 will be uh, back to whatever normal we think we'll be back to in terms of now having to understanding that there is this disease that'll be in the, on the earth forever and what we do about that. So, right, right, absolutely. Uh, Pregnant women and breastfeeding, what is the recommendation on vaccine? So, uh, they're saying, uh, of course, talking to your gynecologist and, or obstetrician, uh, understanding that if you have any severe risks, if you're pregnant in terms of the baby or yourself, talking to them first, but generally the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, that's what they're called, they're saying to get the vaccine. So whether you're pregnant or a lactating breastfeeding uh, woman, to go ahead and the, to get it, the risks are, you know, the benefit is over the risk of 
anything happening is, is better. So uh, they do recommend to get it. But of course, there's always outlying people that may not be able to get it because of certain issues with their pregnancy or certain issues with their child or things like that. So, yeah. So there's no actual virus in the vaccine. It's, it's almost like just the memory of it. So that's why they're like, it's not going to pass a live virus on to Correct. the baby. So messenger RNA is kind of like a, a, a sending a message or an email or a Snapchat. There's some people saying Snapchat because it goes away, goes into the cell, says, hey, this is how we make the spike protein. The cell picks it up so, and then that thing disappears like a Snapchat just disappears. It's gone. So now the cell <laughs> remembers. Cell remembers took, you know, took a, a live shot or whatever screenshot of the thing. And then it tells the immune system how to recognize this spike protein is what they are targeting. So the spike proteins are on the outside of the, of the virus and that's um, what goes into the cells to replicate the virus. So that is what they're used. That is what the mRNA is telling the cell to do. All the immune cells come in and memorize it. And we have something called memory immune system that, caught, that remembers things. So if it ever sees that spike protein again, like if we catch the virus, Immune systems remember it, go, hey, I remember you, and start making um, antibodies against it. So that's how it works. So. Now, this is a little bit off topic, but when it, when at first, when they were talking about, about the vaccine, because there weren't trials for pregnant women and lactating women, they didn't really at first recommend it, but now that they know more, they have. And I noticed something in general across the board when it comes to breastfeeding, extended breastfeeding. So my boys just turned three. I am trying to wean them, but I have yet to be successful. So they only might be. So it's only around sleep. Anytime you look up recommendations for a medicine, a vaccine, anything in coordination with breastfeeding, it's always talking about an infant. So I'm always so unsure if I should follow that recommendation for a toddler who is only nursing at night versus an infant who nurses all day and is a little tiny fragile baby. That's a good question. And always there would be to call me or Tanya, you know, ask, yeah. ask one of us to look it up. But um, usually as the children get older, they have less of a risk of whatever thing that may come through the breast milk. Um, just because they're getting older, their bodies are more mature uh, versus an infant that's new. Um, so generally those risks go down, especially if they're barely breastfeeding, because it's more so of what's coming through the breast milk and, and at what amount is coming through. So if you have an infant who's breastfeeding every two hours, if you take some kind of medicine that may affect the child, that child's going to have more of a dose of that medicine coming through the breast milk. And they test different medicines with breastfeeding and we have a way to look that up to figure out how risky it is. So if a child is breastfeeding less, you would assume they would get less of that issue right. and not have such an issue. And if they're older, they may be able to deal with that medicine better than a, an infant would. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another thing that I keep seeing people say is, why do we need a vaccine? Why aren't doctors just promoting a healthy lifestyle so that we have a strong immune system and we're less likely to get sick? So we doctors have been pr trying to promote a healthy lifestyle <laughs> for, <laughs> for decades. And um, a lot of people claim that we doctors don't talk about the healthy lifestyle, healthy eating and exercise and sleep. And that's especially as a pediatrician, those are questions and things I talk about all the time. And so I can we, attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> we have, we do talk about it. We wish that our population and our communities were super healthy superheroes who ate perfectly and slept perfectly and exercised perfectly and have, would have strong, robust immune systems because of that. But that may not be the case, uh, you know, as we know that obesity is a high percentage rate in um, America and all of us have struggles with our weight and um, different foods may cause different issues. And uh, we're all perfect, basically. None of us prove, none of us are saying we're perfect and we all have risks. So we always advocate for healthy living, health, you know, good, healthy foods, you know, eight to 12 hours of sleep a night. Um, and, um, you know, <laughs> drinking water and exercise, we all advocate for it. You know, some of us are really good at it. Some of us are not as good at it, but we try, we're always, you know, trying to be the best we can be. So when we have a vaccine that's going to help us prevent, as we try working on that perfect superhero lifestyle, you know, this vaccine is going to be something that's going to protect us in the long run. So hypothetically, if we all had perfect health, we all did what we were supposed to do, and we had these 
beautiful, healthy, strong bodies, would a vaccine still be necessary? Probably, probably, because if, with COVID, COVID is a novel virus, something that the human body had never seen before. So every human who catches COVID is going to have a response to it, whether it's a mild response or a severe response, we don't know. It's, COVID is a strange one where we just don't know who's really going to have, a, which kind of response they're going to have. So we probably would need it because it's something new our bodies have not ever seen and don't have any memory cells in our immune system to fight it. So we're get, the vaccine is giving us those cells so we can fight it. So what do you say to people who say, well, COVID is just like the flu, so why are we concerned about it? It's just like the flu. We see the flu every year. Most of so us So that's survive. the point, right? <laughs> so flu also is a, is a terrible disease. Flu also has, you have no idea how one person versus another person is going to react to it. You may have a very healthy person who dies of a pneumonia because of the flu. You know, children can have terrible, severe reactions to catching the flu, while others just have a mild course and they're fine. Kind of just like COVID. Um, flu, however, we have seen flu for eons and eons and eons and decades. And so our bodies have immune cells to fight against it. So it, it, so, so potentially we um, do better with it because we already have seen it before. And people like me who get the vaccine, flu vaccine every year, I don't get the flu because my body has enough immune, immunity memory cells to fight off anything. Um, so, so the flu is bad itself, but we do, we've had this history of trying to treat it and get rid of it in our population. Um, so COVID, like I said, it can, can be mild and it can be severe, but we don't know. We don't have enough information. We don't have any, enough years of humans catching the virus to really tell us what it's going to do in the long run, like we know with the flu. Yeah. Majority of people have fairly mild or have a kind of a flu-like where they feel really crappy for a week with the COVID and then they're fine. But you still have those people who go from zero to 60 in a few days and are on their deathbed or die, uh, you know, uh, so quickly after the COVID. So we just don't know enough and, and COVID's gonna be here forever and this is the first year we've seen it. So there's gonna be big things that we learn about it. So we should take precautions no matter what. It, it, whether it's like the flu or not like the flu, it's something new that can kill us. So we should take precautions. Which I find so interesting that people say, the vaccine is so new, we don't know enough about it, but they're willing to chance getting a new virus. Well, right. we don't know much about it. So it's like, the catch twenty two to them, I guess. I just, I guess they yeah. think that the virus is not as bad as the vaccine. But in general, I would say the vaccine is better than catching any virus. I don't want to catch anything and be even sick for a few days if I can not, you know. No so. doubt. Now, do you think it's been around for longer than we know? Like some people have speculated. Probably not much. Probably not for years and years. Probably maybe a few months longer okay. than we know. Um, some data shows that it may have been here in America earlier than we thought and in China earlier than they thought. But I don't think it was here for a long time and we never saw it. I think it was just maybe a few months difference with people figuring out what was going on. Okay. All right. I guess I didn't have it then. A couple of years ago on Christmas, I was so sick for like two weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, my eyes were just bright red. I got tested for the flu. I got tested for strep three times. And every time I got tested for something, it was negative. And I've never in my life felt so horrible. Mm. And the only thing that made me feel better was I went on a, a round of steroids. Mm -hmm. And eventually I started to, to feel better. But man, I was probably sick for a month. And then you could never determine what it was. When you say red eyes, it makes us all think about when you have a serious like flu-like illness and some red eyes, we think of adenovirus. So adenovirus goes around in spring and fall time and it can cause sinus infections, pneumonias and red eyes and high fevers. And a lot of times people mistake it for the flu. So it could possibly have been the adenovirus that you had and that's why your flus were negative and your streps were negative. So okay. <laughs> yeah, there's so many of these ugly viruses. Yeah. Earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's so crazy. That's probably what it was. Because yeah, mm -hmm. my fever, I couldn't get my fevers down. I was getting up to like 105. It was bad, but I survived. So. And it, yeah. I think about that time, and I'm like, man, I wonder if 
that's what people are experiencing with COVID. Some are, some are. It was so bad. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're going to see another spike now after the holidays? Yes. Unfortunately, I think I do. I think a lot of people have become um, tired of COVID, tired of the precautions, <laughs> and they just wanted to get together with their families. And all of us, I understand, I'm tired of it too, but um, I think a lot of people had parties and brought people together. And just like in Thanksgiving, and we saw the spike for Thanksgiving recently. It's about a two week lag usually. So I think, yes, unfortunately, we're going to have a pretty serious January winter, you know, because of it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't feel like winter in Arizona. It's like <laughs> <laughs> and already in Arizona, winter is um, for us. Winter in terms of flu season is January through March. So okay. our worry, of course, is we'll have flu overlapping with COVID, and we will mm -hmm. have a hard time distinguishing and figuring out what's going on. The other hope we have is if people wear their masks, they're not going to catch flu or other things because they're wearing their masks around people and social distancing. So maybe we won't see such a bad spike. You know, but masks. Can we talk about masks and Absolutely. how they work and why they work and why people don't believe in them? I think, unfortunately, masks have become a politicized item. I think if somebody, no, if you could see COVID flying through the air at you, wouldn't you want something protecting you from inhaling that thing? I mean, someone's when someone's talking and they accidentally spit, don't you like just get disgusted? Like I just inhaled that person's spit when they were talking to me. <laughs> Can you imagine like you're in a restaurant and COVID is flying around everywhere and you're sitting there without a mask on and inhaling every particle around you? Um, masks are just a simple protection against particles flying into your mouth and nose and making you sick. It shouldn't be a politicized item. It shouldn't be anything about your freedoms or anything like that. It's just a, a simple three layered piece of cloth. Hopefully you get three layered ones that protect you from catching a terrible disease. And that's really all it should be. It doesn't take it doesn't take more than a second to flip it onto your face when you go into a restaurant or or hopefully not a restaurant. I don't want to even go to restaurants right now. But <laughs> into, <laughs> into, into, your tar, into Target, into Target, <laughs> or wherever you're going, and just flick it and flicking it onto your face and getting your work done and coming back out and you know taking it off in the car. It's it's not a difficult thing to do and it will protect you from not only COVID, it will protect you from anyone coughing on you with anything else. Right. I know people are like, well, why haven't we seen the flu? Oh, it just disappeared. I'm like, well, maybe because we're all wearing masks and we're all washing our hands more and we're all staying in a little bit more. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just, it's so funny to me because when people contradict themselves, I like have to point it out. So people say, oh, we don't make a big deal about the flu. We never talk about the flu. Why are we talking about COVID? But then they turn around and say, why is nobody talking about the flu? Did it just <laughs> disappear? I'm like, wait a second. You said they never <laughs> talked about it in the first place. Like, what are you thinking? <laughs> now, you know, every doctor talks about the flu from mm -hmm. no, August to March. We talk about the flu every right. time we see you. So it's not that no one's talking about it. We're talking about it. <laughs> oh, I remember something I wanted to say before. We were talking about um, how people were saying, you know, oh, just make everybody healthy, build immune system, talk about health. I yeah. can't tell you how many times I've seen celebrities, people in the media, people I know, complain that their doctor is telling them to lose weight they're like yes i know i'm fat like leave me alone but <laughs> that i mean that's health related you know so it's like people don't want to hear it if it's them but then they want to preach to talk about um boosting your immune system right. i mean i know when i go to my doctor with something i know if it's something that i think my weight is affecting and so when she tells me, you need to start eating healthier, you need to start exercising, I know why. But a lot of people just don't want to hear it. So I feel like, man, I feel like doctors and just anybody <laughs> who is a clinician of any kind right now, is it's just like, what do you do? Like, you can't win. We just try to, again, like like uh, Dr. Horner said, we try to be compassionate. We try to, we try to understand their fears. We try to, we try to, give information in such a way that it's listened to without triggering a response of putting up a wall because you don't want to hear it kind of thing. I mean, I'm overweight. I know I'm overweight. I'm, if a doctor tells me I had to lose weight, I'm going to acknowledge, yep, I know I got to lose weight. Um, but that, you know, that's a triggering thing for a lot of people in, in our world who we are always struggling in that aspect. And so when a doctor brings it up, sometimes it elicits an emotional response that makes makes them angry or scared or you know 
So if we can pose those things in such a way that is relatable to what's going on, like your cholesterol is a certain number, this if you lose weight, this will help and things like that. But on the other side of it, we don't want to just assume everything you have yeah. is because of your weight. Now, some doctors, unfortunately, really hammer that in and sometimes forget to look at the bigger picture as mm -hmm. to why. Maybe that person's sick not because of the weight. Maybe there's something else going on. But unfortunately, that's something that is visually seen when you go to the doctor. And a lot of diseases do have a relation to how much you weigh and, and how much if you if you change the way you weigh, how you weigh, you'll get better from a certain thing. But again, we don't want to overlook things that are not necessarily related to it. Maybe something else going on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm very, very happy we covered so much. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Any parting words for my listeners? I just want to say, you know, thank you for letting me talk to you about the vaccine and COVID and just trying to alleviate anybody's fears of both COVID and the COVID vaccine. And just hope that people who are watching your podcast will understand that we as healthcare people and the scientists, we're just trying to make you healthier. We're trying to get rid of the scourge that's running across our world. And we just want to keep you guys healthy and, you know, alive for your next generations. And we're not here to to do anything we're not lying to you we're just trying to give it to you straight and uh, i thank you for letting me have a platform to talk about that of course and thank <laughs> you so much for everything that you do and having that compassion with within everything that's <laughs> happening i know like every you know i have a friend who's a pa at an urgent care and and just so many people in my circle are working on the front lines and it's hard so i just wanted to say thank you for oh, no problem you know, we don't always need thanks. We're, we do it because we want to help the world and the people yeah. and our patients and the world around us. So it's great to have a, have people tell us thank you, but we'll do it no matter if you thank us or not, because that's our passion. So. And that's what this pandemic, I think, has shown, at least me, because I feel like, for the lack of a better term, healthcare is being shit on by a lot of people. And you guys just continue to, this is what I do. And I just, I do. just think it's really cool. And that's why I love working in healthcare. Good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, you too. so much. No problem. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Whew, that was some heavy stuff. Uh, I hope that you guys got so much value out of listening to Dr. Loki and all her recommendations. She's just a wonderful person both personally and professionally and I'm happy that she's somebody that I know in my life and if you have any questions go ahead and comment them because I am sure that she would be happy to help me respond to those so stay safe wear a mask wash your hands get vaccinated when you can and subscribe to my channel